Hi everyone, I'm here with Dr. Bennett, a, um, a uh, assistant professor and also a physician who's double board certified in surgery and, or sorry, in uh, anesthesiology and um, chronic pain. Chronic pain. Okay, yeah. thank you. So could you kind of give us an overview of anesthesiology, chronic pain, and maybe a little bit of uh, general surgery since you've had experience with that too? Sure. So uh, I'll start with general surgery actually because that was my original. Uh, goal going to medical school was to do orthopedic surgery actually and then I, I changed my focus from orthopedics to general surgery partway through medical school uh, just because I wanted to keep my options open for different surgical specialties. Orthopedics is pretty uh, focused in orthopedics whereas I thought I might want to do some type of reconstructive surgery, um, minimally invasive surgery and so general surgery can be opened up and you can do multiple things. Um, so I matched into general surgery at University of Florida in Jacksonville um, and uh, started out there. I did two years and wasn't thinking that um, that was going to be the right fit for me long term in my life. Um, just the commitment, the hours, the lifestyle. Um, I loved surgery but um, thought that it wasn't going to be um, the best fit for me in the long run. Um, so I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to go into at that point, but um, I really loved critical care. Um, and uh, critical care is a big part of, um, of surgery, of anesthesia, um, of a lot of, um, well, a lot of medical practices, but big. Um, and I was already uh, doing a lot of critical care and surgery, so um, I actually took a break from general surgery and did a surgical critical care fellowship. Um, and in that year, um, I realized that um, I really liked the operating room, but I, I liked the critical care aspects of surgery more. And um, I decided to switch into anesthesia, which um, has a lot of critical care. Every, every general anesthetic is a fairly fairly similar to critical care, except it's a controlled, a more of a controlled setting, but um, uh, anesthesiology has been a wonderful field for me. Um, you get a lot of surgical exposure, uh, a lot of critical care exposure. Um, we do uh, quite a few procedures, um, which I also really enjoy. That's, that's still part of my, my surgical passion. Um, uh, I don't get to sew anymore, but you know, have to do what I can. Um, and then um, I really had an interest in chronic pain management. Um, I, I really enjoy uh, talking with patients and, um, and, and, ma and managing pain issues. Um, chronic pain is a very different subspecialty of anesthesia in the sense that you're not in the operating room. Um, you, you have a clinic practice. You see, you see patients in the clinic, you follow them in the clinic, and you do procedures um, uh, in the fluoroscopy suite. Um, and so it's a very, very different uh, subspecialty of anesthesia. Um, but for me, I thought it was a nice, it was a good way to go um, to give me different opportunities as I go through my career. Um, I have my um, operating room, critical care kind of field, and then if I so desire in the future, I also have my chronic pain field where I can have a clinic practice, set my hours, um, do my procedures, um, and then chronic pain also helps me within anesthesia because we manage a lot of chronic pain patients doing anesthetics for other surgical uh, procedures. So um, it's been a really nice um, a really nice career for me so far. So chronic pain is a subspecialty of anesthesiology? It is. So um, a lot of chronic pain programs are, um, are subspecialties within anesthesia departments, um, but a lot of those, pro those fellowship programs will actually take um, residents from, or fellows from different residency programs. So um, I did my chronic pain fellowship here at UC Davis. Uh, we have a wonderful chronic pain department. And um, within my fellowship class, we had uh, three of us were anesthesiologists. We had two physical medicine and rehabilitation and um, one neurology fellow. Um, so we were a nice mix. Um, they've also had family practice 
and I think we had one internal medicine at one point. Um, so you can really come to chronic pain and psychiatry, excuse me, and psychiatry residents will do chronic pain because a large part of chronic pain is actually a psychological, there's a lot of behavioral, psychological factors, psychosocial issues that go into chronic pain as well. So um, chronic pain is really a multi-specialty or multidisciplinary field. And so that's a really, really exciting thing about chronic pain is you actually are working with other disciplines. And so you really get an idea of how to manage illness, uh, different, um, you know, pain syndromes from different specialties. And so uh, you just learn a lot more than you would just from your anesthesia or your surgical background um, because you're learning from other disciplines, which, which is really exciting. Get that interdisciplinary kind of um, opportunity there. Yes, and then you work with psychology. You work with, uh, I mean, you have your PMNR, but you work with psychologists, psychiatrists. Um, we work with acupuncturists, um, a physical therapists, um, occupational therapists, diet dietitians, nutritionists, exercise physiology. I mean, there's. There's a lot that goes into treating some of these chronic pain patients, and so a very comprehensive chronic pain program will incorporate all those different disciplines into managing these very challenging patients. Okay, so what other um, subspecialties are there in anesthesiology besides uh, chronic pain? So there's um, cardiac fellowship, um, pediatric fellowship, uh, there is uh, neuro fellowship, critical care, um, obstetrics. There's a new sleep medicine subspecialty. Uh, a what? S a sleep medicine. Oh, sleep, okay. Um, regional anesthesia is a new fellowship, and actually uh, we're about to start um, a regional anesthesia fellowship here at, uh, within our program, so that'll be something that's coming. Um, so those are all the subspecialties within anesthesia, and then um, there's also simulation fellowships. Uh, where you just specialize in teaching simulation, uh, we don't offer that here. Um, and here at UC Davis, we offer chronic pain, pediatric, um, and cardiac currently, those three uh, fellowship positions. Um, and then, as I said, we're about to start a regional anesthesia fellowship as well. Um, so could you kind of walk us through a typical day in your life um, as an anesthesiologist? Depends on where I'm assigned. So um, I wear a few hats here at UC Davis. Um, uh, a typical uh, general OR day starts between 6.45 and 7 o'clock in the morning. Um, and that's because our OR uh, start times for our first cases is 7.30. Um, I am rarely working solo, so here at an academic center I um, will be working with residents or um, CRNAs, which are certified uh, registered nurse and um, anesthetists. Um, so if I'm working with, uh, if it, when I'm working with the residents or the CRNAs, I come in um, after talking with, uh, with either party the night before about our cases. Um, I come in and we do a preoperative interview with the patient and then um, get a full medical history, past surgical history, allergies, all the things we want to know, Al um, allergies when they've last had anything to eat or drink, um, and then um, any problems with anesthesia in the past, and then um, any specialty things uh, as far as if they have any religious uh, reasons they would not accept blood products, things that could affect our case. Um, from there, we want to make sure our operating room is ready, set up. We have to check the ventilator, make sure we have um, oxygen flow, get all of our medications ready, all of our equipment. Um, we run through very standardized checklists to make sure everything's set up. Um, sort of like a pilot preparing the plane to take off, right? Um, and then following that, uh, we bring the patient back to the operating room, start our cases, and um, that's how the day flows. We'll have um, I'm usually assigned to anywhere between um, one and three operating rooms, and then um, I manage, uh, I do the same thing in all the operating rooms that I'm assigned to, um, discussing cases, um, making anesthetic plans, teaching, managing the patients. 
Um, so that's a general day, typically somewhere between 6.45, 7 in the morning to about 5 p.m. in the afternoon, 5 to 6 typically. Um, if, I, if I'm assigned on obstetrics, it's a little bit different because now I'm in labor and delivery. And we have scheduled C-sections, we have laboring patients, um, we do anesthesia consultations for difficult parturients in the sense that if they've had back surgery and can't get an epidural, if they have neurologic problems, if they are morbidly obese or um, have difficult airways, just things that we need to be aware of up front. Um, if Jehovah's Witness, um, other things that would make us need to have more of a plan in, uh, set for the, um, the very high risk obstetric patients, which we see a lot of here at UC Davis. Um, and that's one on, I'm one on one with a resident from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. in the day, or 5 p.m. to 7 a.m. overnight, so depending on how I'm scheduled. And then if, I, if I'm the acute pain attending that day, so if I'm wearing my pain hat, then um, typically I get here somewhere between 6 and 6.30 to uh, get prepared to um, do regional anesthesia blocks, whether if that's the upper extremity, the abdomen, the lower extremity, putting in epidurals, um, all those things we try to get um, two or three of those um, pre-start blocks in before the cases start at 7.30. And then we, we manage all of our um, catheters on the floor. We have a rounding service, um, and that's one-on-one -on -one with a resident. And sometimes we have an intern or and a visiting medical student or, or a UC Davis medical student. So we have a small team. Um, and then we do um, adjunctive pain procedures for pa patients going to the operating room. We do, we do some blocks. Um, uh, in the hospital and then we round on all of our catheters and and do uh, pain management with that so uh, It can be a little variable those days can the pain days can be long um, six to Whenever the blocks are done which tends to be somewhere around six in the evening um, um, But that's that's a, that's very exciting and there's a lot of teaching and talking about pain management so it's like you do a lot, you have a lot of different roles and mm -hmm. I think a lot of people they want to try to pursue different things like whether it's different roles in a clinic whether it's like teaching in an academic setting mm -hmm. or maybe like research or other things like that how you recommend someone pursue those different avenues and um, like kind of incorporate that into their schedule uh, so so that's gonna come down to um, really what you foresee your career to be um, I think if you're interested in teaching um, usually staying at an academic center it's going to be the way you need to go um, I did after I finished my chronic pain fellowship I did do um, two years of private practice um, one year of a hundred percent chronic pain when I first finished my fellowship and I really missed anesthesia and I missed the operating room I missed that critical care part that was missing from the chronic pain side so I actually did some locums tenens, which we can talk about if you want, which is um, sort of a fee-for-service way of, um, uh, of working as a physician, and that can be many fields have locums tenens positions, but um, I contracted myself um, as an independent contractor with different practices and filled in and did certain shifts, um, and I did chronic pain, some pediatric anesthesia and some general anesthesia in that time and I um, really was working at several locations uh, four different positions and really missed the teaching aspect um, when I was doing that so then I've kind of seen a lot of different aspects and I, I, I miss the interaction with the university and the, the teaching part and so if you want to go into private practice you're probably not going to be doing as much teaching because you're doing a lot of your own cases, um, you're managing everything yourself. Um, to do a lot of um, teaching, you're gonna wanna be at an academic center, and that's gonna entail uh, probably starting early. Academic centers typically typically wanna have people that, are, are, that they know are interested in teaching, so if you've been in private practice for a very long time and then wanna come back to teaching, it can be a little more difficult because you're gonna come in at the lower level starting out um, and have to build your, sort of your reputation in academics. Um, and so I think if you're interested in teaching, then starting out in an academic position 
would be the way you'd want to go. And I think coming out of residency, you would want to look at places that have a academic programs. So, um, you know, UC Davis is the only academic program really for most specialties. There are, um, I believe there are some other family practice specialties at other Sacramento locations, but really for the majority of, of medical specialties, UC Davis is the academic center and you don't have any until you get out to, you know, out in the Bay Area where you have the other big academic institutions. But, um, and to do academics, um, not only are you going to need to teach, but you also have to be productive. You have your clinical duties, the operating room and things. You have your teaching duties. Um, and then you have also your res research requirements, um, which doesn't tell you to stay pretty active in a lot of fields. You mentioned locum work and being in private practice. It seems like the tendency nowadays is for most specialties to go into like bigger groups, so like hospitals and things like that. Is there still a lot of opportunity to go into private practice in anesthesiology, or is that kind of shifting to? Well, private, so, so when I say private practice, um, it would entail um, not being in ac at an academic center, but within a big group mm -hmm. at another location. Mm -hmm. um, I would say any, any position really outside of an academic center mm -hmm. is somewhat considered private practice. So um, whether you join Kaiser or Sutter or Mercy, um, small other anesthesia groups, those would be all be private practice type places. Very few, very few individuals go into true private practice anymore where you are just your own LLC mm -hmm. and you set everything up and then you contract out yourself. You typically join another group's contract with a hospital and then satisfy. You work within that group as a partner. There's a lot of things to think about with that as well. When I did locums work, I actually was an independent contractor. I had not set up my own LLC, so I didn't have my own kind of business. Um, but um, I was a 1099 employee, um, and so um, you know all my my medical expenses really are written off through that position. And then I had to work on paying my paying my own taxes and all those things. It's a little different than being a W-2. Um, and there, there, were, there were a lot of nice things about that, but um, uh, it can be, there, there can be a few more balls to juggle when you go that route. Yeah. Are there any misconceptions about uh, anesthesiology? There's quite a few misconceptions. I actually thought all the misconceptions when I was a surgical um, resident. Um, it's kind of funny. I never thought of doing anesthesia when I was a medical student. I didn't even do a, a rotation as a medical student. It wasn't required. Um, and so anesthesia was never anything I was interested in. Um, and so as from the surgical side, some of my misconceptions were um, it's, com like, it's completely boring. You don't do anything. You push a little, you know. Uh, you know, all of the small syringe and half of the big syringe and then, you know, you, you might, you know, you, then you intubate and you sit up there and the patient's kind of on autopilot and um, that is actually sort of what I thought as a surgical resident, which is, which is funny. And I, and I had had no exposure of anesthesia, so I had never rotated um, and uh, that was just kind of my misconception. Um, that it was boring, there wasn't anything going on, um, and uh, um, other things. Uh, we're sitting up there just reading the paper or, you know, doing so do, so do go. That's, those are some of the misconceptions, but um, there's a lot of management that happens that just you're not aware of when you're on the surgical side. Um, a lot of um, preoperative management, a lot of um, chronic illnesses of the patients that you're managing, um, you know the patients very well. Um, I would say a lot of the times um, as the anesthesia provider, um, I know the patient better than the surgeon. And, and not, a, not, not every case, not every surgeon, but a lot of cases I know a lot more about the patient's health than the surgeon does. And um, I'm sort of the, the protector of that patient. Um, 
Um, I don't think this patient should go to surgery for XYZ. They're not optimized in this way. And I direct a lot of that management um, find things. Um, for instance, a patient I took care of yesterday at same day surgery just had a triple A found incidentally on a CT scan on Monday that he had the CT scan for his stones that uh, for his abdomen. They incidentally found this, the surgeon didn't know. So in my preoperative workup, they said, there's a, tri there's a triple A there, you know, um, abdominal aortic aneurysm, um, you know, and the surgeon didn't know. And so we had to have this whole discussion preoperatively, should this patient come for an elective surgery? So I think there's a, there's a lot more to anesthesia than just patient presents and you put them to sleep and wake them up and that's it. There's, there's a lot more that goes into it. You, you really manage a lot of patients and help them out with their care. Um, we see a lot of patients that have undiagnosed, undiagnosed sleep apnea and we get them in to get sleep studies. We do special monitoring for them. Um, they're at high risk of um, sudden respiratory death um, following anesthesia because um, they get opioid. Um, some of the rewarding aspects are um, you're watching over a patient for their surgical procedure. You're um, making sure they're safe. You're like their guardian angel through the case. They're putting themselves in a very vulnerable position, being under general anesthesia, being completely unconscious. They're trusting you to take care of them. And it's very rewarding to take a patient through an anesthetic and to have them wake up on the other side and be so thankful that they're awake and they made it through and they look at you and they're just so thankful that you took care of them. That's very rewarding. To bring their family member back and say, you know, they're fine, they're awake. There's just a lot of um, gratitude at that point, um, which is exciting and rewarding. Um, also from the pain management side, when a patient is writhing in pain and you come over and you do a quick nerve block and you watch them relax, there's a lot of gratitude there as well. And that feels really good. Some challenges are um, just the misconceptions about anesthesia. Sometimes there can be, um, you know, just, just comments you hear from other specialties. They don't know, they don't understand um, everything that goes in, the complexity of anesthesia. I, I mean, I know I didn't understand until I was in anesthesia. So sometimes some of the misconceptions can be frustrating certain days when you know you're doing a lot, but it's not per you, people don't perceive you as doing much. Um, the hours can sometimes be a little bit crazy, but that's going to be any surgi or surgical type field. Um, it can be a little bit unpredictable um, depending on what type of a shift you're on. You could be doing standard elective cases. You could also be getting trauma cases. Anything could walk in the door. And same with obstetrics. We could be doing straightforward elective sections that go bad. We could be doing crash sections of patients coming um, off the street. You just, you never know. Some of that can be a challenge. It can be stressful. Um, you have to have thick skin um, and you have to be prepared to um, make quick decisions. Um, you can have uh, rapid physiologic changes in a case and you have to be ready to act and, and you, you can't um, be afraid to go into work not knowing what's gonna happen because a lot of times you, you just have to be prepared for a disaster. And so um, I would say anesthesia is not for people who um, it can't handle a lot of stress. Um, you need a good support system. Anesthesia can be, um, can be very trying. You can carry a lot of weight on your shoulders because you do, um, patients can die for nothing that was your fault but in your care. Um, and that can be hard. I've lost several patients, um, uh, been involved with the care of several patients who have died right in front of me and it's, it's, it can be hard, it can be hard uh, physically and with a lot of talk about physician burnout and physician suicide um, and phys physician, um, like lack of physician coping and um, 
uh, uh, getting addicted to, to different um, kind of stress relievers, that, that can be a negative, especially in a field that has a lot of stress like anesthesia. So it's not necessarily for everybody um, because of that um, high intensity, high intensity moments and stressful moments and uh, needing to think very quickly even when you're fatigued. Um, and so um, that, can, that can be an exciting thing, but I think that's probably more of a challenge because um, that can be difficult to sustain um, if you don't have good coping skills. You mentioned burnout. How would you recommend well, med students, residents, or even when you become a full physician, mm -hmm. how do you recommend we prevent burnout and also establish like a work-life balance as much as possible? That can be a struggle, and I think it's being aware of what your limitations are. So trying not to take on too much at work. I know that's something something I do frequently. I try to do absolutely everything I'm asked, and that's just not possible. So um, I think. Um, making sure that you don't overextend yourself, overcommit yourself, especially when you're getting started, that you allow time for yourself. So, um, you know, a lot of us want to try to, you know, you're all, right when you're coming out, you want to make as much money as possible because you've been, you know, we all owe so much money coming out of medical school and, and residency. I mean, you're, it's just so long until you're, you're actually working in your field that you just want to work all those extra shifts and um, you want to try to be as profitable as possible and um, that's really for most of us not going to be sustainable so I think it's having a nice balance um, uh, realizing that you you do need time off um, I think staying with a regular exercise program um, I mean I th just simple lifestyle things taking the time to exercise taking the time to not do anything work related and and just um, you know go to a movie um, I think for me uh, spending time with my colleagues outside of work is a good balance for me because we work very closely with each other here and so to step outside of the hospital and go to dinner or um, you know um, go to happy hour those things really keep up morale realizing that you need a break so there's sometimes that um, when I'm at work and I am having a rough day and having a hard time, being able to um, have a network or be with my colleagues and say, I need to take a break, I, I just have trouble right now, being able to reach out for help, I think that's important, is being able to communicate, um, something that we don't always do well, we don't want anybody to see that we're struggling and sometimes you just need a moment. And then decompressing, so really being able to get things off your chest at home and talk about your day. So having just a good support network, whether that's a friend or a spouse or you know a loved one, a family member, whomever, um, just being able to to talk and get things off your chest so that you can decompress and not keep things um, internalized. Um, and then having a good, um, whatever program you go to, having a good sort of support system or um, you know unbiased third parties that don't know you at all, that can just sit there and listen to you and um, they don't judge and they just listen and that's something awesome that we have here at UC Davis um, for um, supporting um, the staff, the physicians and nurses and everybody working. So. Kind of going into how to get into um, anesthesiology. Mm -hmm. uh, first, you mentioned that uh, you want the DO route mm -hmm. instead of the MD route. Could you uh, briefly mention, kind of give us an overview of the differences between an MD and a DO? Sure. Um, well, I chose to go the osteopathic route uh, because this, um, I originally had wanted to do orthopedic surgery and um, osteopathic osteopathic medicine. I mean, there there's a lot of similarities between the two. A lot of the the, the curriculum in medical school is very similar. The osteopathic training um, has, has a, a bit more emphasis on how um, structure and function interrelate. Um, so uh, the basis for osteopathic manipulative medicine or OMM or um, um, osteopathic manipulative therapy, OMT, you might hear it both ways, um, is um, kind of optimizing um, 
structure, so um, just the structure of our body to help optimize function. And so a lot of our, uh, a lot of the manipulative medicine that's sort of the framework of the osteopathic side of medicine, we teach um, how to correct structure to help with function. And um, I thought that'd be very good for orthopedic surgery, which is how I initially got into it. And um, that really interested me. As far as getting into school, the, the prerequisites were the same. You needed the same um, undergraduate prerequisites. And then you still, uh, you took the same exams. And um, I just, yeah, that those were the reasons I guess I chose to go to osteopathic school. What tips would you give medical students to get into a competitive residency like anesthesiology or um, I guess you did surgery first. Well, I guess you mm -hmm. could uh, talk, touch on also, um, I've heard there there have been some some of a bias against uh, osteopathic students for some reason. Maybe you could expand uh, a little bit on that as well. There has been some bias in the past. I think to get into a competitive residency, um, you're always you're always going to have a better chance if a program knows you. So um, if you're really interested in a program, uh, doing a, um, a sub-I in the specialty at locations where you want to go is really important. I know for me, I went to um, Arizona College of Osteopathic Medicine in Glendale. It's Phoenix for all intents and purposes. Um, and I really wanted to come back to California. I ended up in Florida, but um, so I did several sub eyes at, at big programs in uh, California. Actually, I did a surgical sub eye here at UC Davis um, in 2005. But getting exposure to the programs you want to go to, if you can, um, is uh, excellent because if they know you, then they're going to feel more comfortable having you in their program if you did a good job. Obviously, you want to do you want to do really well in school, so um, you know keeping your GPA up, and you know there's that standardized testing, which um, really is the way all programs can standardize. It doesn't matter what school you went to, if we see your scores, um, that's that's a big chunk. I mean, really, um, I think just getting the the Comlex or the USMLE. Uh, as high as possible, obviously we always want to do as well as we can, um, is going to be very important. Um, as far as from the osteopathic side, there was a little uh, bias that how could you compare the Comlex, uh, which is the osteopathic equivalency to the USMLE, when they're different tests. And I think for osteopathic students uh, trying to get into competitive allopathic programs, for me, I wanted to make sure there was no question about how I would compare to an allopathic or um, MD uh, candidate. So I took, I sat for both Comlex and USMLE parts one and two, um, so that they could, so that programs could see both sets of my scores. Um, I only, I had, I only took the the third step of the Comlex because that's my license. Um, it didn't matter. I was already a resident. I mean, I was already in a residency program. But um, I think having that UCL, that USMLE score, there was no question about um, how I would compare to allopathic um, other allopathic students. That was over ten years ago, and there's a lot of talk now that the. The programs are merging, or uh, the, there's going to be um, less of a, a difference divide between the two, and so going forward, I don't I don't know that it's necessarily necessary to take both. And my guess is, in time, there's there's a standard test across the board would be my guess in time. So uh, the way things are now. I don't know how necessary it is. So a lot of programs, uh, UC Davis has osteopaths and in all programs so I, I don't know that it's an, an issue but if there's any uncertainty sit for both exams you're studying for you're studying for for one why, why not take the other I what I mean MDs don't take the DO side but if you're concerned from the DO side then you're studying for the complex I didn't do anything different for the USMLE they, it was like taking the same test twice <laughs> to be honest yeah. Go sit through that then. Yeah, and pay for it. Yeah. Since things are always changing, um, not with just, just in programs, but with medicine too, how would you recommend people to stay on top of medicine since it's changing so fast? That's a good question. I'd like to have a crystal ball. You know, I think it's try not to get caught up and, and stressed or 
um, worried about every little change. There's always, um, I know at least in anesthesia, there's there's always been the fear that anesthesiology is a somewhat of a dying profession with nurse with nurse anesthetists coming up and you know what's going to happen and um, you know that's I'm sure there's these concerns in every field and with constantly changing um, health care reform and um, how our country uh, pays for things and how how patients have access to care and what the payers are doing and there's so much that goes on and changes you know I think for for each for, for medical students coming up is to just don't get just don't don't get too worked up at each individual moment just it's it's your life it's your career there's always going to need there's always going to be a need for physicians in whatever specialty you're doing so just do what you're passionate about don't go into a field because it's supposed to be the next thing um, or it's a safe field or it, it, things can things can always change so I, I think the best thing to do is keep your head up and focus on your goals and and what's going to make you happy what in the end we just all want to be happy so um, you can't get caught up in too much of the the news and the hype of the day, the day to day, because you you just get swallowed by it. Kind of going on that, are there any changes in medicine that you see um, that's kind of like coming up in the next few decades? Like I know EMR was like a huge thing over the past mm -hmm. few. I don't know that I'm the best person that to ask me like don't get caught up in a lot of the the politics and the news. But um, I would say as as we're trying to manage more and more patients with fewer physicians, you know, we're supposed to, it, it's, it's, you know, they're predicting in 10 to 15 years that we'll have a huge deficit of physicians compared to patients who need care. So I would say probably um, we'll see more telemedicine. We're going to see more um, of uh, patients getting care through technology. Um, being able to be a physician here in Sacramento for the really rural areas, um, I think we're going to see more and more of that, and definitely more, just more with technology, more apps. So, you know, we're we're looking at manage my pain apps where we can communicate with patients about their pain and how they're doing at home for our notes through through looking at applications and. Um, I think that's something new. We're we're really going to have to cut down on healthcare costs to maintain the system. And so, as if you know, if patients don't have to come in, if they don't, if there's not a facility fee, if we can have them pull their catheters at home and not need to come in to see us, that all of that saves money. So um, I think that's somewhere we'll be going. Kind of like a decentralization. Almost. Yeah, I think though being able to see, I mean, if we can communicate physically, if I can see somebody on a monitor and we can talk, I, I think we can do a lot. So it's a, cause I worry about outsourcing, like you're just talking to somebody and you don't know what's going on. But um, if you can still physically see patients, you're still getting somewhat of a personal interaction, but cutting down costs, but also making healthcare you're, you're bringing health care to patients who can't otherwise get it. Mm -hmm. That they don't have access to specialists, you know, in, in rural parts of the state mm -hmm. or rural parts of the country. And so you're, you're actually able to get them seen um, when they otherwise may not have been. So uh, last question, How, what advice would you give for medical students to become good doctors? Work on having strong interpersonal skills, communication skills. It seems uh, sometimes redundant to have to teach our residents about how to talk to patients because that just seems so second nature, but the way you interact with a patient is so important to their care. Um, you know, whether it's, it's just the way you sit down next to them, um, the way you just have eye contact and listen. Don't be typing on the computer while they're trying to talk to you. Um, I think that um, those are some things that really make a difference for the patient is just having that communication skill and um, having the patient know that you're listening to them. Um, I think that's the biggest thing. We're we're all learning. We're we're all intelligent people. We're all learning the same 
book knowledge. We we all take the same exams. We I mean we go into different specialties, so we all have slightly different skill sets and knowledge sets. But I think the big difference isn't always a knowledge issue. It's just a it's more of a social being able to. Um, empathize with patients, to deal with patients from different cultures, um, under, understanding, trying to understand where different patients come from, and providing the best care experience for them. And that that all comes with developing how you interact with them. And that's something that's very hard to teach, and not everybody gets. And I think that makes a big difference on who really succeeds and who doesn't. Because in the, in the end, we all have to pass board exams and we all get certified from our respective um, departments and, you know, um, associations and have our credentials. But, um, you know, you'll hear, oh, this person's bad and this person's good. Well, or this person had excellent care and this person didn't listen to me. Well, they're, they're both very smart people, but it's... It's just the difference in how you interact with the patient that makes you really great. Um, and then uh, on the legal side, good communication with patients is going to also help prevent them from wanting to, to sue you. Mm -hmm. And you, you never want to treat a patient just to not get sued, but if you communicate, if they really feel like you're doing, you have their best interest at heart, if that's really, that's your first priority, you're going to be less likely to find yourself, you know, in a courtroom or with a lawyer. So um, just always something we have to be thinking about when we care for patients. So. Okay, great. Well, um, that concludes our interview. Thank you, Dr. Bennett, for, um, again, for being with us. Of course. Um, if you guys have any uh, questions for Dr. Bennett, leave it down below in the description box and I'll ask her and relay the information to you guys. Also, let me know uh, what specialty you want me to interview next. And I'll see you guys in the next interview. Thank All you. right. Thanks, guys. Good luck.